because you've been just that good to us this week. You've been better to us than we've been to ourselves. For sometimes we neglect to do the things that you instructed us to do to care for ourselves. But God, even in the midst of our ignorances and our things that we just ignore doing, God, we thank you because you love us so much that you keep us in spite of. We thank you, God, because even in some of our situations, God, we didn't see our way, but God, you brought us through. We thank you this morning, God, because even when we didn't think we had what we needed, you gave us what we needed, and you've taken good care of us. God, you haven't allowed us to be outdoors. Friday night, Bishop and I were returning home from an engagement that we had to attend, and I was driving, and there's a road that we have to take coming home that is so long that sometimes I don't like to travel that street because I just get sleepy when I get on that long last stretch. So I decided rather than to take that route that I would come off in Irvington and take our route that we take going home from church. And as we traveled up Lyons Avenue, this is about 1.30 at night, when we got up into Irvington almost to Springfield Avenue, we heard a pop, 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 pop. I'm driving, I said, what's that? And Bishop starts looking around, and as I looked to my right, there was a young man shooting in a crowd. Now, just last month, in the news, there was a young, I believe, 13-year-old who was just in a car, passing an area and innocently got shot and killed. And as we came to the area, Brother Kenny, I mean the young man was right there, we could look to our right. Now sad to say, the crowd that he was shooting in wasn't facing him. So that meant that somebody in that crowd that didn't really know what was going on was about to be injured. And when a crowd disperses and starts to run, you don't know what direction they're gonna all start running and who he was actually shooting at. So that meant that here we are driving right past and I could see the flame or the little sparks coming out of the gun as he was shooting at the crowd. Of course, Bishop had to kind of duck in the car and said, step on it, and the lights are red. And I am saying, he said, step on it. Drought. And because they were experienced. 
experiencing a drought, they decided to get together and found it important to go to the church to pray. We're going to pray for rain. We're going to pray for rain. And so they gathered on a particular evening to pray for rain. But the pastor became confused when the people came in to pray. And what he became confused at is the fact that they didn't bring their umbrellas. Did they? They came to pray for rain, but they didn't bring their umbrellas. How many of us are forgetting our umbrellas? We have hope because of the God we serve. The one true and living God. We have a word of promise from him. But we don't bring our umbrellas, our umbrellas in expectation that God's going to do what he said he's going to do. Romans the 15th chapter and the 4th verse says, for whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning, that we through patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. Mm -hmm. We will have patience and comfort through the scriptures Amen. so that we can have hope. Yeah. And oftentimes we say we have hope but we don't show any signs of having patience. And we don't act like we have any comfort. We walk around as an anxious people, a sad people, a confused people, people that challenge God over and over again, folks that even get mad at God for what he hasn't done. But we haven't taken time go through the scriptures in order to have patience and comfort, which is our preparation during our time of expressing and showing that we have hope. There's a millionaire whose life had been greatly changed and he wanted, like Sister Wincy often does, go to the schools and share his experience with this class. And in the process of his preparation to go to the school, he says, what can I say to these children that's going to make these children different? He was going to be standing before a sixth grade class. And this class was made up of Hispanics and Blacks. Already you understand that our levels of, of thinking and, and our experiences in, in our culture is that of despair and discouragement. Because we just don't see how we're coming out. And so he didn't want to go into the classroom talking about a whole lot of stuff that he has and, and all of the things that he does because it would not have had an impact on this sixth grade class. So he put down all this stuff. And he says, I'm going to go in here and share from the heart. I want to touch and impact these children. So he says to them, I'll help. He wanted to encourage them to go to college. He wanted to encourage them to get the education. So he says to the class, I'll help pay the college tuition of every one of you. And at that moment, all of the students sat up tall and put their attention to listen to what he had to share. And as a result of him giving them a ray of hope, over 90% of that class graduated from high school and went on to college because they knew that if they excelled and did well, that my ticket to college was paid for. And this was an article that was posted in Parade Magazine years ago. It says nearly 90% of that class went on to graduate from high school. And some of them returned to say to him, I had hope because what I thought was going to be impossible 
became possible through what you offered and what you said that you were going to do. Now, that's something that happens in the, happened in the natural. But when we move to the spiritual, the Lord tells us in his word, I wish above all things that you prosper and be in health even as your soul prospers. That's what God says to us. He gives us a ray of hope through the fact that if you get in tangled, wrapped up, tied up, tangled up in me, not only is your soul going to prosper, but I'm going to make sure that you prosper and be in health. And a lot of times, God has prepared for us to have and to be, but we don't take the steps of preparation. We have the expectation. We know what we like to happen. Mm -hmm. We know what we want. We've seen things that we prepared in our minds that we want to have, but we've done nothing in preparation for those expectations. Yesterday, we had heard the weather report over and over again that there were going to be some snow flurries, going to be some snow in the air. And I remember as we were getting dressed for our events and activities for the day, when we left the house and got in the car, it wasn't snowing yet. Bishop said to me, he said, mm, we expected snow, I guess we should have brought our boots. Right, we did. <laughs> And in some areas, all it was was slurries. But where we live, we knew there was going to be some snow on the ground when we got home. And that's the way it sits at some time. That's the way we function. We, we hear the message. We know what the Word of God says. We know what has been promised to us. And then we say, hmm, God said he's going to bless me with such and such. But we do nothing to prepare for the blessing. We forget our brothers. Yes. We get wet. We get our outfits messed up because we weren't prepared for what God. You understand? Yes. All you gotta do is get your brother. Get in the word. Yes. Get a prayer life. Yes. Talk to God. Yes. Follow and be obedient to his instructions. Let me tell you something about this whole thing. When we read in the Corinthians. 1 Corinthians, the 13th chapter, the 13th verse. Yes, yes. Now abide faith, hope, charity, these three. And it says the greatest of these is what? Charity. Greatest of these is? Charity. charity, which is love. Yeah, you understand that. But we tend to not include and maybe as important, the faith and the hope. Yeah. Yeah. I've even heard some preach that, okay, we need faith, and we need to love, but hope. You don't need to be hoping on nothing. You don't need to be, oh, oh, hope. That sounds negative. Hope is not negative. Hope is a part of the three that God says in his word. Amen. Amen. Read 1 Corinthians. And understand hope is an essential fundamental element of our Christian life. Amen. Because it tells us when God is willing and ready to provide for us, all we got to do is expect it. And in expectation, we'll prepare ourselves through the way we live, the way we work, the way we act, our connection with God. Amen. Hope is so essential to understand it's a part of the triplets. Faith. Faith. Where's hope? Is there hope? And love. They're triplets. They're important together. You can't decide to have one. What's that song they used to sing years ago? You can't have one without the Okay, yeah. <laughs> Unbelievers don't have 
this same situation going on. They are hope. What are unbelievers? Hope. Let's hope. They have no promises. They have no connection. They have not God. But you who are naming the name of Jesus, we have we have hope. Christ is that essential and important part of our hope. Let me see if I can put it this way. In my house, of all the things that I do and love to do, the one thing that everybody in my house looks forward to is what goes on in the what, everybody? Yes. Mama. Mama. <laughs> okay, somebody's a bag on your cheeks. That ain't the only thing. They got hope when it comes to what's coming out of the <laughs> kitchen might be full of groceries that haven't been put away. There might be some dishes that they left in the sink. <laughs> but their hope is in the fact that I know what to do in the kitchen. <laughs> So I have one and a half that gets up and says, I'm going to eat. I got to eat. Then I have a bishop that says, Bang. <laughs> I'm cooking the name. <laughs> and then he, he, he'll, 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 he'll do it this way. Do I need to go somewhere and pick up something? <laughs> yes, people. <laughs> and all I have to say is, Tell me what you want. Listen, get the message in here. Tell me what you want. Yes, what? And he'll say, I, I don't want to trouble you or, you know, I want to do something. It's not hard for me to do what I need to do in the kitchen. Because I love cooking. I'm not going to say I'm the best cook. There's probably a whole lot of folks in here that can cook stuff better than me. But I love cooking, so I get in the kitchen and I, I found out, you know, when they when they did my kitchen, I said in my mind, I only need this little cabinet to cook, put my cookbooks. I need this cabinet, this cabinet, and this cabinet to put my cookbooks because I've invested myself in trying to find out how to do it better because I want to do it better. But he, you understand? Now I. understand how we need to not let the enemy steal our hope. Some of us have been in some situations where we feel like God has forsaken us. We feel like we're alone. It's not God, it's man that messes things up. And then the devil takes what man does and he messes with our mind and he tells us, see what your God did to you? God didn't do that to you. The devil is trying to get at the thing that is closest to your heart Bishop, I'll do this. He says, I want my wife to do it. I want my wife to fix my Kellogg's Ross place. I want my wife to fix my own. I want my wife to pour my glass of water.
into our territory yeah. and step into our houses. They come in because they see the reputation of our God work for us. They see the confidence that we hold. You see, you gotta understand what hope is. Hope is expectation. Hope is saying, I don't think that God can do it. that we don't like to do, wait. We don't like to wait. I'm expecting it to happen, and it's gotta happen right now. Uh -huh. God says, wait on the Lord. And while you wait, smile, feel good courage. And what he gonna do, he gonna strengthen your heart while you wait. Yeah. It's all a part of the course. Because in the process, God makes us. God builds us up. God teaches us how to speak the words of confidence. You see, when you learn in a language, when you learn in a language, this is straight off the press. Everybody that took Spanish, Italian, French, or German, or whatever language you took, you didn't speak it the same day. You oftentimes came into class and the teacher said, bonjour. Mademoiselle, bonjour, monsieur, or whatever. And you were saying, what am I supposed to say? <laughs> bonjour, uh, good job, vite des That's good afternoon, good job, good evening, vite des And how are you? Ich bin good, I'm good, I'm fine. But well, it took me weeks and weeks to get that. <laughs> but see, once you got it, and I didn't have anybody to talk to when I was learning the language. My mother, I would come home and I say, Good night, Anna. Girl, I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> and then all the times they would ask me, Why did you take German? It was something that I was attracted to. And so I had to indulge, invest time, and all of that stuff to get the language. So I did it for four years. But now we are more than 50 years up the road, and I still haven't had anybody very often to talk to. I remember the late Donald Hinton would come in town. And when he learned that I spoke German, we would have a little bit of a conversation. But I had been so long without it that he had to talk it for a while before it would come back. And then when we had the opportunity to travel to Germany, we would go there and, and the Germans would speak it, and I didn't know to really have a large, long conversation, but because it was in me, y'all get the message now, because it was in me, it would come up, it would well up, and I'd, be, I, and I'd say to Bishop, I remember that, I know what they say. So then he would get excited and say, what they say, what they say, talk to him. He wanted to go open up a German church. I ain't even got I ain't got like that. <laughs> Forget the message. Because it was something that I had invested myself in, given myself to, taking time to learn it, then when I needed it, it went well. And when you take time to get to know God, you don't always know everything you want about it. But because you're taking the time to learn this word, to stay on your face before you get to know who he is. You get to know the individual man and that he is, that he said the spirit of God will stand up in you strong. And when you least expect it, and you're in a situation where you need him to well up in you, good now and he comes up. Good now and he, he appears. He stands up and he does just what you need him to do, but you've got to have hope that he is able. Yes. And then because he's able, you've got to expect him to perform. And then because you expect him to perform, then you step back and you say, I'll wait on you till you get it. Hope. The expectation that something 
or someone has the ability to do what you need done. Our God is the one that our expectations and our hopes lie in. That's where we need to exercise and learn to use our feet. Trusting not in our own abilities, because as we've learned through the word and through the teaching of our pastor and our bishop, that it's not enough just to have faith, but it's to know who you have faith in. Because oftentimes faith in man will fail you. Not only faith in man, but faith in man. Y'all can get that one. Because sometimes we don't meet our own expectations. Yes. Yes. We want to point a finger at everybody else and say it's somebody's fault that we're not where we need to be. But when we're not where we need to be, we need to make the changes so that we can get to where we need to go. You know how your parents are. You put your kids in school and when they don't not necessarily meet the expectations. The school doesn't meet the expectations on teaching and what you expect your child to be able to receive. You move that child. Hey, I get about a hit. They're not saying in this school. That's right. That's right. Or I'm gonna go see somebody until some change is made. And so when it comes to what we're expecting to happen in our lives and the fact that we have hope in God, then as we get in the See what he expects of us. Amen. Hello? Yeah. Amen. Right. Some of us are saying, I'm gonna be a millionaire. I'm gonna be a millionaire. I'm gonna be a millionaire. But you don't know how to spend your welfare check. <laughs> Selling food up the now. It's nobody in here. See, I'm using that as a get food stamps rather than put food in the house yourself. You get a check, don't know how to disperse that check properly, and so you still have nothing. But your expectations are that you're going to be better than you are right now. There's a learning process that has to take place. And before the blessing can come in, you better know how to deal with it. Because like so many that have become millionaires, they can get a penny of the man. There's one who tells and testifies of the fact that he had got $5 million. Yes. When he got that $5 million, he had a, a, a big wedding with a horse and carriage. 